I feel, as I've said before, I feel this is one of the more important things that I've ever preached. I've never felt uh, the urging and the urgency that I felt in this series. And we come into part nine this morning. And and the title of today's message is The Transgressors. The Transgressors. The Word of God speaks of iniquity. It speaks of transgression. And it speaks speaks of sin. And I always just kind of considered that as all encompassed. All of these things are, in fact, sin. But they're not all transgressions in, in the fact that there, there are different definitions for iniquity, there are different definitions for transgression, there's a different de- uh, definition for sin, although all of these fit the category of sin. Turn in your Bibles this morning to uh, Exodus 34. Exodus 34. That's towards the front of your Bible. If you're not familiar with your Bible, if you're not familiar with your Bible, you need to get familiar with your Bible. Amen. I didn't get a hey man there unless I urged it on. You should have jumped all over that one. Exodus 34. 7. 34 and 7. If you're there, say amen. amen. Keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgressions and sin and that will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children unto the third and fourth generation. Now there's a lot of false teaching out here about generational curses, and uh, it, it comes from this particular, one of the, uh, the scriptures that comes from this particular verse of scripture, but that's not really the emphasis of what I'm preaching on this morning because it says there, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgressions and sin. There's three different things that are mentioned there that require forgiveness. So I realize that if that was worded that way, then there must be some sort of different meaning, although there they're interlocked together in in the understanding of what they are. They're all sin. Transgression is a sin, iniquity is sin, and obviously sin is sin. But everything is not a transgression. Everything is not necessarily an iniquity. The word iniquity there actually means perversion. And it signifies sin through perversion through pride and presumption. Those things that we do uh, uh, in, a, in a sense of, of being prideful for what we do, those, those are described as perversions and as iniquity. And I'm going to skip transition and go straight to sin there. It says sin is merely an offense committed through error or mistake. And so sin obviously would encompass all three of these. But what we want to focus on today is the word transgressions, the transgressors, if you will. And you know we've been talking about the end times, that this entire series is about uh, uh, the end time and, and, and the things that are taking place in our day as we're still here, the things that we know that are going to begin to take place shortly hereafter, we're gone or the church is raptured out. And so I wanted to look at transgressions as a whole. And transgression literally means revolt. It intends rebellion against God. Everybody in here has sinned at some point in their life. But the bulk of the sins we commit are either by error or by mistake, as opposed to doing it out of just out and out rebellion. Now, all of us have been rebellious at some point in time in our life. We've all had that, that streak in us and that place in our life where we just rebelled against the things of God. Rebellion deals with uh, a, a lot of factors. 
rebellion, number one, is demonic in nature. Now, the word demon is not even used in the King James Version of the Bible. But the word demon is uh, uh, used in, in the Chaldean, and it uh, has a, a different pronunciation, but for the sake of, uh, uh, of clarity today, we're going to use the word demons when actually the King James Version describes it as devils. We know we call the devil the devil, but then the Bible talks about devils, plural. And the meaning for that is either demons or angels. Now, obviously we know that God's angels are not demons. It's pretty, pretty clear. There is controversy as to where do demons come from. And there's some theories out there, and, and I'm not here to declare that my theory is correct this morning over someone else's. I'm just telling you how I interpret the Word of God. And, and, and I'm not uh, trying to put myself in a class with those theologians who are uh, obviously superior in Bible knowledge and, and wisdom more so than I. But as I'm preparing this message, the Lord led me in a particular direction. And I truly believe, although it's not a popular belief, I believe that demons are nothing more than fallen angels. And, and a lot of people say, well... You know, angels have a body, so uh, that can't be true because they're always seeking to possess someone. Well, we're going to look at that a little bit this morning. We're going to kind of look at that. And, and, and the reason that I'm spending so much time on demons is not to, uh, to corner a phrase, not to be finding a demon behind every bush, but Christians need to understand about demonic power because that's what you're facing every day. In all likelihood, the devil doesn't have a clue who you are. The devil's not omniscient. He can't know some seven billion people that are alive today, much less all the billions of people that have lived in the past. But he is a very uh, God-given intelligent being, and he has, he has a, an organization, if you will. Just like any other thing that is on the face of this earth, you have a corporation, you have the head of that corporation, the CEO, if you will, and then you have your managers underneath that and then on down the line all the way down to those worker bees who do everything. And so Satan is no different in his organization of that. The Bible doesn't tell us a lot about that, but it does, it does break down into powers and principalities and, and rulers uh, uh, in high places. It does give us scripture to go by on that. So the reason that I believe that, that demons are fallen angels is because that's really the only evidence in the Bible that is indicated that. Uh, my, my first question to somebody would be, well, where are all the fallen angels if they're not demons? And their answer to that probably would be, well, they're all in Tartarus. No, they're not. The Bible tells us that, they're, that, that they did have relations with women. Genesis, we've already, we've already discussed that. I won't rehash that. We know that those particular demons, or fallen angels, were bound. They were bound because they left their first estate. They were bound because they left their habitation. In other words, they, they crossed a line that they were not supposed to cross. Now, we know that after the flood, there were still giants. We know that Goliath was a giant. He had at least four brothers. Some people... Uh, say that it wasn't his brothers, I, you know, uh, I'm not going to go there either. It's not important. We know that when Caleb and Joshua and the other spies went into the promised land, they said the land was full of giants. And so we know that those, this particular group of demons or, or whatever had relations with the, the women of earth again. Now, what I'm going to say now is purely supposition on my part, but it only makes sense to me that sooner or later they'd get the idea, hey, we do this. He's going to lock us up. He's going to lock us up. So at some point, this practice stopped. Now, I think that that's the very reason that fallen angels or demons is because 
if they possess a human body, then they can partake of the sins that they want to spread. You've got to understand that an angel, according to the Word of God, an angel can change into whatever he wants to be. Zephaniah talks about uh, angels in, in, in the form of women. Most of the time you see angels, they're in the form of a man. There are even other verses of Scripture that, that call angels different things. And so uh, that's my opinion on that. Again, uh, the Bible is not exactly 100% clear on it. But I, for the purpose of this message, that's who I feel that I'm talking about. Now, this rebellion that is going on deals with these fallen angels. That's why the Word of God tells us that, well, let me back up a little bit. The fallen angels and the worship thereof, you understand that Satan fell because he wanted to be like God. And although he has devils or demons or fallen angels underneath him, they want the same thing. They want to be worshipped. They want to be held up. They want to be revered as gods. That's why the Bible speaks so much in the Old Testament about idol worship. Idol worship is nothing more than a, a fixed object of adoration. It could be this tissue box for purposes. That will be our idol this morning right there. That's our idol. That idol represents a particular line of demonic activity or a particular demon. As you study through history, you'll see where different uh, countries serve different gods. They all come back basically to the sun god, Ra, who is, who is Satan himself. But through this, these idols receive that that they can't receive because they're invisible. Have you ever wondered why angels are invisible? Why didn't God just make angels where we could all see them? You, you know, come to church. I've had people tell me, oh, I, I went to church the other day and I saw angels sitting up on the light fixtures, you know. Well, I've never seen an angel. And I'm not saying that no one else has. But God made them invisible for a purpose. And when you read the Word of God, when you study the Word of God, you'll find that every time an angel appeared, the first thing man wants to do is bow down to him and, and worship him. So that's a very good reason for God to make angels invisible because he doesn't want to share his worship even with the good angels, much less demonic angels. So we have this, this problem of these fallen angels. These demons have, have a problem of being able to manifest themselves in a certain manner. They, they, can't, they, they can certainly influence what goes on in this world. They can certainly be involved in what's going on in this world. They can certainly oppress us. They can, they can come against Christians, but they can't possess us. Amen. The Holy Spirit will not allow, the Holy Spirit will not dwell in a habitation. Now, some people, uh, I've heard it taught that, that we can be depart departmental. I say, how do they put it? Compartmentally. Compart mentally sectioned off like a house full of rooms. Demons could be in one room and the Holy Spirit in another. Well, I don't believe that. I don't believe that that's possible because when the Holy Spirit comes in, everything else has got to go. Everything else has got to go. Once that Holy Spirit comes in, that believer is set free from the power of the enemy. Sometimes, uh, sometimes you do have to cast demons out in order to uh, for a person to be saved, that, that, there's a resistance that goes on. And the resistance is not by the Holy Spirit. The resistance is on the part of the individual themselves. A lot of people don't ever get delivered from demons because they don't want to be. The demon has such a hold on them that they really don't want to be set free from that. And so... A person has to be willing to be set free from a demon prior to someone being able, I can't just go and cast a demon out of somebody despite their own personal desire. It's all God always gives us a choice to either receive him or to reject him. And that's why rebellion is, is such a, uh, a tr such an abomination unto God. Because it is an absolute, total rejection of everything that is Christ. 
It's an absolute revolt against God's system. God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the Trinity, we know as God. And all worship, all adoration, all love goes toward God. So anything that intervenes in there, anything that comes between that is a state of rebellion. That's why the Bible tells us that witchcraft is as the sin of rebellion. Because it de- I just kicked the demon. Uh, it deals with a rebellious heart. It, de- it deals with the idea of absolute, complete rejection of all that is God. And that is an abomination to God because God is reaching out. He's reaching out with a hand of mercy. He's reaching out with a hand to, to try to draw that person, that individual, away from that. And the demonic power is working against that. The, dr- the line has been drawn between demonic power and God a long time ago. They've already crossed the line. They've already become absolutely, uh, 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 have made their decision to revolt against God. And so mankind is given that same choice. We can either accept that that is Christ, or we can reject that that is Christ. Unfortunately, most of the world lives in, in rejection. Is that a, a sin? Is it an iniquity? Or is it a transgression? Well, the transgression began in history's past. Depending on what your thoughts are on the gap theory, it either began prior to this earth being established as we know it, or it happened, uh, obviously it happened when Adam and Eve sinned. So there's a rebellion going on. There's a revolt going on. And we ask sometimes, God, when are you going to come back? God, when, are, when is it that you're going to come and set us free from all these things? Go to uh, Daniel chapter 9, Daniel chapter 9 this morning. And let's look at, again, uh, familiar verses of Scripture to you. I know you've heard it many times before. But remember that God is dealing with Israel. Everything revolves around Israel. God, that's God's chosen people. We are grafted in. We're in we're, we, ha, we inherit the promise by virtue of our faith in Christ. But the promises were made to Israel. The promises of the Word of God were set up because that was His chosen people. We become His chosen people by virtue of accepting Christ. Okay, Daniel 9 and 24 9 and 24. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people. And I'm not going to go into, uh, in lessons past, I've covered what a week is here. A week literally means seven years. And, and there's scripture to verify that. that. That would take too long to go into that this morning. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression. To finish the transgression. To finish what? Seventy weeks are determined on Israel to finish the revolt and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity. Once again, there you see them described as three different things, iniquity, sin, and transgression. But this time, transgression is what has to be finished. Transgression, the revolt has to be put down before iniquity and sin can come under control. Does that make sense? And to bring an everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and prophesy and to anoint the most holy. Now, the most holy here doesn't mean just Christ. It means all that is holy. It's not the holy. It's the holy. Okay? So that all that God makes holy, all that God is, all that Christ is, he is part of this holy, but it's also the church and, and all those who believe and all those in Israel who will turn to him. And so... The anointing of the holy, the anointing of of God's eternal plan is depending upon the finish of the transgression. Now flip back over to 8 and 23. Daniel 8 and 23. Now we know that this 70 weeks, we know that 69 of those weeks have been accomplished by virtue of of, of study of the rest of the Bible. Again, I'm not going to go there this morning, but 69 have been taken care of. And then there's a period of time there 
that takes place prior to this final week, this final seven years being accomplished. And that's what we're talking about this morning. That's, that's the, the tribulation period that we know so much about and hear so much about. A seven-year tribulation period that will begin with the signing of a covenant by the Antichrist. Now, once that happens, then the clock will begin to tick, and there will be a, an approximately a seven-year period that will take place where there will be tribulations such as the world has never known. <clears throat> and I talked uh, last Wednesday night, we talked about judgment. We talked about specifically judgment upon the United States. And I don't know if you're following the whole series or not, but you need to get that tape. I, I, I want to kind of verify one thing that I said Wednesday night. I told you a long time ago, if I make a mistake in something, I'll be man enough to admit it. I, I mentioned something that I had done some study on, and I'm still not sure one way or the other. There's two camps on this thing, uh, uh, and I was speaking in reference to the destruction that could take place as a result of a planet that they've discovered that is supposedly going to come between Earth and, and the sun. And when it happens, it's going to cause all sorts of uh, uh, natural disasters here upon the face of the Earth. Now, I, I told the Wednesday night crowd, I said, at first I thought it was a hoax, but then, you know, I found evidence that, that kind of substantiated. Well, there's really evidence that goes both ways. So uh, I, I don't know if this planet is uh, going to accomplish what they say it's going to accomplish. They claimed it's going to happen this year. But I did some more research on it and found out that they claimed the same thing in 2003. So whether it's coming, when it's coming, I don't know. I, I'll, I'll put that to the side for the moment, and I'll say this. Judgment is still coming to the United States. That I will not back off of. Judgment is coming to the United States. And when it gets here, I, I pray and hope that the church will be long gone and raptured out of here. I believe, actually, I believe it will happen simultaneously with a rapture. That's my personal belief on it. The Bible is not clear on that. But I, I believe that once the church is gone, then the chaos will begin immediately. And so, which I think will help propel the Antichrist, and he'll be the man with all the answers. Uh, Daniel 8 and 23 says, In the latter time of their kingdom, when the transgressors are come to the full, once again, we see this finish of the transgression. We talk about a period of time when, when the revolt comes to the full. In other words, when the rebellion is done, when it's accomplished everything that God intended for their rebellion to accomplish, you've got to understand God's not overpowered by this rebellion. Like everything else that the devil does, God uses it. And God will use it to fulfill prophecy. He will allow certain things to take place to accomplish his purpose. And his purpose is to bring Israel to a place where they will finally accept him as the Messiah. That they will finally come to a place where they will see Jesus Christ as Lord. And in order for them to do that, they're going to have to first be deceived by the Antichrist through the power of demonic worship, through the power of demonic activity that will take place and that will accomplish the devil's goals as well as God's goals. The devil's theory, I, I can only surmise that somewhere along the way, the devil's theory is that he's going to overthrow God, that this revolt's going to be successful, and that he'll be able to accomplish his goals. Well, he's never been able to do it yet, and he's not going to be able to do it during this period of time. But the, amen. But the problem being for the average human being is that those who are not saved are going to be either deceived or they're going to give their lives for God during the tribulation period. And a lot of people are gambling. They're literally playing Russian roulette with their soul. Gambling that at some point in time they're going to turn their heart and life over to Jesus Christ. And I, I heard a preacher say this one time and I've hung on to it ever since. If you can't live for Jesus in this world, what in the world makes you think you can leave, live for Jesus when your very life is going to depend upon it. There's no way. Those who have 
heard the truth. We, we've already studied 2 Thessalonians in chapter 2. We've already studied that in, in that particular chapter. It says those who reject the truth, those who have sat in church houses, time and time and time again, and sat through altar call after altar call after altar call, and stubbornly refused to give their heart and life to Jesus Christ because they were afraid they're going to have to give up their partying or whatever it is that they hold dear and near to their heart. I know I did it for years. That's why I know so much about sinful people. I, I, I are one at one time. Used to couldn't even spell it, now I are one. That's how that goes. But I'm saved now. Saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. But people hang on to the world. They don't want to, they don't, there's something there that the devil tells them they cannot give up. And that's something they cannot give up is an idol. And it's just about as worth just about as much, probably not as much, as that box of tissue paper. But they hang on. We, in, especially in the Pentecostal realm through the years, we have labeled just about everything as idols. We labeled Everything that from football players to baseball players to music to rock and roll singers to country and western singers, uh, we've labeled that as an idol. It does become an idol, and I think we're correct in that. It does become an idol when that particular thing comes be between you and God. When it becomes something that you allow any worship, any adoration, to be applied to that would keep you from worshiping God. Doesn't mean that we put that football player on the same goal as God or in the same plane as God. But when it comes between you and your relationship with God, that's as much as giving it worship. Yes, sir. Now, that doesn't mean we can't have anything else in our lives. That doesn't mean we can't enjoy anything else in our lives. It's the magnitude with which we do it. It's the importance that we put upon it. And it is whether or not it comes between us and God. Yes. If, and, and I'm going to get on it again, on the music thing. When we allow music to influence us, yes. and don't tell me it doesn't influence you, okay? I, I can remember in my wilder days before I met my wife, you put Hotel California on, I wanted a beer in my hand and wanted to drive fast. So don't tell me it doesn't have a spirit with it. Don't tell me it doesn't make you want to do things that are not godly. That kind of spirit that is behind that, and I'm not saying every song uh, has a demon spirit behind it, but, but if, if that music has that kind of spirit to it then the, the subtlety and the things that it slowly but surely drags you away from God yes. makes it an idol. Yes. And there's been a lot of, you know, hard rock and, and, and heavy metal music, rap music. Yes. Uh, most country and western has a spirit behind it that is not of God. It is not of God. I, and, I, and I know that some of you are going, mm, give up my country music now. You don't give up my rock and roll. That's between you and God. But if it leads you away from God, if it brings that spirit, I, I still like the song, Hotel California. I still like the Eagles. But I can't listen to it. I cannot sit and listen to that. We could, we, we'd be traveling on a vacation, going down the road, I'm thumbing through. All of a sudden, come on, song. Me and Candace both going. You know, we've been in the world, you know. And after, after about, about 15 seconds of that, it begins to kind of get in. You know, I can get down now. I'm telling you I can. Old man or not, I can get down. But it gets in your spirit, begins to influence your thinking. And when you're thinking, when, when the devil gets in your mind, he's already got an open door to your spirit, okay? And so you can reject this teaching all you want, but you know down deep inside I'm as right as rain. 
I'm not right because it's me. I'm right because what this word of God tells me. Now, if a song can do that, if a song can do that, and, and music does have, you got to understand that, that Satan was in charge of the orchestra, okay? He knows music. And that's why there's so much demonic activity around music, even gospel music. And I'm really going to want some of your toes now. You even have to watch gospel music because there's, there can be the wrong spirit with that. And the next thing you know, you're yielding to that spirit. I know I've been in the gospel music business. I, I, we, we did that for several years. We got lied to, we got cheated, we got stole from, all in the name of gospel music. Just because it says gospel music does not make them saints. <clears throat> the Oak Ridge boys finally got around to admitting it after years and years and years, and they finally just said, hey, look, we just want to be country and western singers. We just knew we couldn't get into the business, couldn't break in that way, so we come in through the back door. They said that, I didn't. Not an exact quote, but it's basically what they said. You've got to watch out for the devil. You have to be knowing that he's there to trip you up. He's there to snare you. And once he snares you, he can lead you into rebellion before you know it. That's why certain gospel singers had to get drunk to get on the platform to perform. Because they no longer had the Holy Spirit behind them. And they couldn't perform. And that's what a lot of gospel music is. It's just a performance. Now, I know I'm really getting in your territory this morning. I love gospel music. Don't get me wrong. But it has to have the anointing of God on it. There's nothing more than the devil entering in. You know... If, if I stood up here and told you that the devil couldn't get into a preacher, wouldn't none of you in here have a problem with that? You'd be going, that's right, boy, you preachers, you know. Man, you guys, you all think you something, you know. This preacher fell, that preacher fell, this happened, that happened. That's true. And that's why we have to be just as careful. If you're involved in music in any way, you have to, you have to guard your heart and I preached on that here a while back. You have to guard your heart against what the devil wants to do. Because before you know it, iniquity will come in, pride. And then you're something special because you do music. Hey, I not only played gospel music, I played in honky tonks. And I like being up on that platform and four cans come along, of course. I like them girls looking at me, going, he's in the band. So you had a certain status if you was in the band. That doesn't stop with church. That does not stop with church. It should, but it doesn't. Because we have to guard our hearts against what the devil wants to do. He, devil doesn't knock on your front door and go, devil here, come to tempt you. I'm getting off subject here this morning. Didn't mean to spend that much time on it. But the transgression has to come to full. There comes a place where the revolt is going to have to come to an end. God's going to allow it to take place to do one thing. To bring Israel to their knees and to him. And before they can do that, they're going to accept hook, line, and sinker, everything. Or I say they, a good bit of Israel, will accept hook, line, and sinker, everything that the Antichrist has to say because everything is being set up as we speak now to accomplish his will. It's not going to happen just, you know, everything be hunky-dory one day and then total chaos the next. Now, maybe a, a manifestation of chaos may happen immediately. But everything else has to be set up. And, and I've, I've preached this since I began this series. You're being primed for it. Your children are being primed for it right now. The schools are in on it. The schools are in on it be, not because all teachers are evil. I'm not saying that. I love those who teach their kids and love the kids and care about them. But the system 
is as rotten as the government is. The system is setting your child up to receive the one world order, to receive everything that Satan wants to accomplish during the seven year tribulation period. The problem is that we have Christian children going to these same schools that are being influenced by these things. That's the purpose of this set of teachings is to not only to alert those who are not saved, but to alert those who are saved to continue to pray over their children and continue to watch and guard their hearts as best you can. You can't make the decisions for them. But during World War II, prior to World War II, the first thing that Hitler did was attach himself to the children. Begin to brainwash them and teach them. They were literally reporting mom and dad as being violators of whatever law. They were turning in their parents because they were good Nazis. And we say, well, that can't happen in the two, year 2012 or 2011. Oh, don't you count on it. Do you know right now that your children are taught to report you if you violate any green laws? This green stuff, you know, I'm all for, for being conservative and, and, and trying to you know, recycle what we can and do what we can to save the environment as best we can. But, you know, we pretty well already glitched the environment. We pretty well stomped it pretty good. But your children are being taught to rat on you. Now, if you think they're going to stop at that, then you've really got your head in the sand. It's part of the revolt. It's part of what the Satan has set up because it's part of the rebellion that's going to take place. He has to have your children in order to accomplish all of his goals. The problem is that you have the youth of today. They're out there doing uh, Occupy Wall Street and whatnot, violating the law in, in some of the instances. And most of them don't even have a clue what they're doing out there. It's all being fronted for and paid for. Who do you think's feeding these folks? What do, you think, what do you think it costs to feed a thousand protesters? You think they're all on pensions and, and spending their own money? Somebody's feeding these folks. Somebody is fueling this thing. Yes, sir. That's right. yes. You know, if you start burning leaves, if you keep piling leaves on it, and boy, I can do this at my house, I could burn leaves for days. As long as I got fuel, I can burn leaves. As long as I put something fresh on that fire, I can burn it. Well, that's what's taking place with Occupy Wall Street. And don't think that these people don't have an agenda. Don't think, even if they don't know what their agenda is, those that are behind it have an agenda. And it's all socialistic. It's all about taking wealth from, away from the, the rich and allegedly giving it to the poor. And all it's going to do is transfer wealth from some of the millionaires to some of the other millionaires. The ones that are smart enough to figure all this out. Or, or evil enough to figure it all out. The word... Um, in Exodus 34, 7 there is talking about and it makes reference to idolatry. Once again, idolatry is an inanimate object or it can even be an aminate object that is an image of the demonic deity or whatever is being worshipped. And that's why God hated idolatry so much is because it, it, it's in the form of, of an image or a figure. It's in form of uh, uh, something to worship. And God will not share his worship with anybody. The Bible says that he's a jealous God and he will not share his worship with anybody. Now, y'all just pray for the baby. He's just not happy. He don't like my preaching. He can't help it. Idol worship honors and reveres a creation that God himself created. Whether it's a rock, a lump of wood, or whatever it might be. 
And so we're literally giving praise, we're giving worship to something that was created by the Creator. Turn your Bibles to Isaiah, back to your left a little ways, a couple of books, and go to Isaiah 57. And we see a description of those who transgress in this verse of Scripture. Isaiah 57. Now notice what the first sentence says, verse 3. The first one that I'm going to read anyway. 57, Isaiah 57 and 3. But draw near hither, ye sons of the sorceress, the seed of the adulterer and the whore. Against whom do ye sport yourselves? Against whom make ye a wide mouth and draw out the tongue? Are ye not children of transgression, a seed of falsehood? A son of transgression. Those who are, those who are generation after generation being involved in idol worship. Inflaming yourselves with idols under every green tree, slaying the children in the valleys under the cliffs of the rock, among the smooth stones of the stream is thy portion. They, they are thy lot. Even to them hast thou poured a drink offering. Thou hast offered a meat offering. Should I receive comfort in these? Upon a lofty and high mountain hast thou set thy bed. Even thither wentest thou up to offer sacrifice Behind the doors also the post hast thou set up thy remembrance, for thou hast discovered thyself to another than me, and art gone up. Thou hast enlarged thy bed, and made thee a covenant with them. Thou lovest their bed where thou sawest it, and thou wentest to the king with ointment, and didst increase thy perfumes, and didst send thy messengers far off, and didst disbase thyself even unto hell. Yes. That is a description of idol workers. That's a description of transgressors. And what's being declared here is that, once again, Bible is as the sun is, uh, excuse me, witchcraft is as the sin of rebellion. Rebellion is closely tied to witchcraft because the first thing that you, you do when you become part of, a, a, of an, an occult situation, the first thing they're going to do is ask you to pledge yourself to them and them alone and not only pledge yourself to Satan or whoever the, the local deity may be, the local idol may be, also you have to reject all things Christian. You don't have to reject Buddhism. You don't have to reject Hinduism. You don't have to reject any religion other than Christianity. That right there ought to tell you where to turn. That ought to tell you who to serve. Because that's, the, that's, that's who they fear. If you get... Let me back up. Sorcery and idol worship is always akin to and attached with knowledge. Now, the word knowledge always has a, a, a particular positive connotation to it. Well, we should all have more knowledge. We should all know more than what we know. But if your truth comes from anywhere other than the Holy Spirit, if your truth comes anywhere other than the Word of God, if your truth comes from anywhere other than God Himself, then that truth is going to be linked with and tied up with falsehood and error. Amen. And so what demonic power is all about is to take what God and His angels know, the truth that they know, I mean, if they, can, if they can transfigure themselves from one place to another, if they can become vi visible and invisible, we know that angels have that power to suddenly appear to man. Right. That sounds like science fiction, doesn't it? Uh -huh. But when we read the Bible, we know that the Bible's truth. Right. We know that knowledge comes from God, right? right. So we know angels have certain capabilities and certain knowledge that we don't have. So here you have fallen angels, demons, if you will, who have the same knowledge. Remember, they were at one time part of God's angelic force. One third went with Satan. 
So they know things you and I don't know. They know how to accomplish. They know how to do supernatural things that we don't have any clue about. And what draws men unto Satan is this hidden knowledge. We read about it in Ezekiel chapter 8 where they were in hidden down in the hidden chambers, the elders of Israel, the very leaders of that nation were in the basement of the temple in a hidden chamber. Ezekiel chapter 8, you don't have to take my word for it, read it. And there are images on the wall. We know today that uh, pyramids just blow everybody's mind. How in the world those poor ignorant people back in those days built those pyramids? How did they do this? How did they do that? How did all of these alleged uh, 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 landing strips on tops of mountains that, that are drawn in figures. I mean, how did all of this get accomplished? Were these Indians or were the Egyptians that smart? No, they had demonic power teaching them these things. Yes. Knowledges and truths that you and I don't know. That's why God tells us not to dabble Amen. with enchanters, Amen. with sorcerers, Amen. with witches, with witchcraft of any kind. It's as the sin of rebellion because the revolt is the, one of the main uh, iniquities and perversions that, that Satan and his demons accomplished is the giving over of this information to mankind. Sharing this hidden knowledge, and it's, it's real. Some of these things, that's how they conjure up demons. We know that Jesus hung on the cross. He said, I could call upon my father right now and have 12 legions of angels here. You don't think Satan can't do the same thing with demonic power? Satan lacks one thing and one thing only. If he crosses that line that the fallen angels that are in Tartarus crossed, he knows he's got to lock him up. God won't allow that, in other words. So Satan and the demons have to have human interaction. That's why the human being has to be the one that conjures up the demon. Now, I don't believe Satan is under the same guidelines as these angels. You've got to understand that Satan was a created being. He was one of the two morning stars. He was there, Job uh, chapter 35, I think it is, 32, somewhere in there. He and Christ were present during the creation of the earth. The Bible says that, that the Lord spoke it into existence. Yes. Right. Satan heard that. Yes, sir. He knows what was spoken. Right. We know that everything Satan does is anti-Christ. It's, it's the opposite of what Christ is. Right. So if he said it, he'd say it backwards. Right. You've heard of this playing records backwards and all this kind of stuff? Right. I always thought that was hocus pocus. Right. It's real. Yes, sir. Everything Satan does is backwards. Even down to Michael Jackson's backward dance. That's satanic. No, oh, Brother Malden, you're going off a deep end now. I'm telling you. We, we, we can't stick our head in the sand any longer. I, I've been saved now for 20-something years. I grew up in the church. That's another 18 years. So for almost 40 years of my life, I've been in church. Proud to say that's more than half my life. I don't remember anybody ever preaching and teaching anything on this. I'm not saying that patting myself on the back. I'm saying that it's something we need to know about. We need to understand. If you're a card shark, I want somebody to tell me before I sit down and play cards with you. If you're someone who, who cheats in, in, in financial arrangements, I want somebody to tell me before we sit down and do a financial yes. transaction. Yes. But yet we have the church sticking its head in the sand, yes. not wanting to go there. And, and I'll admit there's not, God doesn't give us a great deal of information on this, but when we begin to study it, we say there's a whole lot more than what we ever thought there was. Yes. And so we gotta know that this is real. Now, you don't have to believe everything. You know, somebody's already said that I was setting dates. 
I'm, I'm going to tell you something. And I said this one night, I'm going to repeat myself. You said that, there's one of three things. Yes. You either absolutely don't know what you're talking about. Amen. You don't know the Word of God. Amen. Or you're lying on this ministry. Amen. And if you're lying on this ministry, may God judge between me and you. Amen. I have not set a date yet. Amen. Not going to set a date. Amen. If you think that's what this series is about, then you don't know what you're talking about. Amen. You're not listening. And if you said that, you need to repent, whether you said it by error or whether you said it on purpose. You need to repent of your sin. Because this is serious business that I'm preaching, and I'm not preaching this for recognition. I'm not preaching this to do anything other than do what God has told me to do. And I don't, I don't know if anybody said that or not. I was told it was said, and it hurt me not because it hurt my feelings, but it hurt me because of what I know God's trying to do through this series of messages. You're not hurting me. You, you, you're speaking against God. Yes. And you're on dangerous territory. Yes. And that's all i got to say on that subject. Uh, Romans 8 and 38. Go there, please. 8 and 38. Not, eight, not, not my favorite scripture, 8 and 28. Go to 8 and 38. We, we come back to this fallen angels issue, and I just want to make a couple of quick points here. For I'm persuaded... And it's talking about losing your salvation. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. I think this verse of Scripture, again, confirms we're talking about fallen angels when we're talking about demons here. It does not mention them as demons, but it does mention angels. Well, we know that's not godly angels, because godly angels certainly wouldn't do that, but... Angels of another line would certainly maybe try that. It says, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities. It mentions it in the same breath as principalities. Uh, further, 1 Corinthians 6 and 3 says that we will judge the angels. Yes. We're not going to judge God's angels. We're only going to judge those fallen angels, not only the ones that are in Tartarus, but the others that are there. Uh, Psalm 78 and 49, you can mark this down, read it later, or go there if you'd like, but uh, it talks about sending evil angels among the nations that come against Israel. Now, I don't think God's going to dispatch any of his angels to be evil, but it tells us very clearly there that God still uses even those angels that are serving Satan. Serving evil angels, he calls them evil angels. It doesn't say angels to do evil. It says evil angel, specifically declaring that they're still around. Yes. You see, Christ does everything by the blood. Everything was accomplished by what he accomplished on the cross. Amen. And his blood washes away our sins. Once again, you have Satan coming along. Here, here Satan is doing his own thing, his antichrist thing. Yes. And what he does is try to wash the minds of mankind with his knowledge with all this secret knowledge that he has. We know that in Ezekiel chapter 8 that the elders of Israel were involved in this. You've got to understand that the elders of Israel at that time were, might as well have said Congress or the Senate. They were the ones who, uh, outside the place of a king, they were the ones running the country. And they were involved in demonic worship. And as you know, if you read Scripture, all of Israel, once Israel and, and, and Judah split, Israel never had a godly king. Never. Most of the kings in Judah were ungodly. There were a few that served God. But if you read the Old Testament, you'll find where a good many of those kings were ungodly. They were all endued and imbued with the same power the same teaching that the elders in Ezekiel chapter 8 was accomplishing. Why 
with those who are of such a line of thinking, why would they ever set that aside? Why would they say, well, you know, I realize if a person gets saved, they're going to put those things away. But you know and I know that the devil's alive and well today. What I'm trying to tell you is this activity is still going on. Now, my personal belief is I have no proof one way or the other. I can't prove uh, who is and who isn't. My personal belief is that the powers to be that run the world are still involved in this demonic activity. See, Satan still is required to involve mankind in what he's doing. He can't accomplish his, his goals here on earth without mankind. And so we have all of these that are involved in this. Now, they're all expendable. He didn't care anything about them. He doesn't do it out of love. I don't think there's even any love between Satan and his angels. You know, I, I think if they could take him out tomorrow, they would. They all want the same thing. They want, they want to be like God. I mean, they didn't just say, well, we're going to go to Satan because we love him and we don't love you. They went with him for a purpose and a reason. They thought they could overthrow God. And if they could overthrow God, they can rule earth, the universe, anything else that they want to do. Now, the new spiritualist, that's a new word for new agers. They don't like to be called new agers anymore because they got so many, uh, they, they say they got so many nuts running around. That's, a, that's quite a statement. But they, they all believe in aliens and, and, and aliens from outer space. And you know and I know, I mean, for the last 20-something years, I, I, I've heard so much about UFOs. I'm, I'm just thinking, what is going on? Something is going on here. And as I begin to study the Word and as I begin to, to, to think about the end time, it dawned on me that this whole idea of aliens is going to be used somehow by the Antichrist. Because I'm telling you, people are primed for it. When I, got, when I was born, they were still talking about the Roswell incident, and everybody was scared to death of uh, UFOs and flying saucers, whatever you want to call it. But through the years, the same thing that is happening, you remember me telling you about how good was changed to bad and bad was changed to good. The same process has been used on this line of thinking with aliens. There was a time where you were a nut if you believed in them. Now you're a nut if you don't. And so the process of thinking has changed. The average American, the average human being that, that thinks on these things believes that aliens are real. And, that, and this is what the New Agers teach. This is what the New Agers teach. That they're going to come back and they're going to help us to save us from ourselves. There, we, we have developed physically from tadpoles to what we are now. You know. <laughs> Uncle Froggy. And we've, we've come from tadpoles to mankind. Now the next step is to evolve spiritually. And you're either with them or they just soon you die. And they have as much as said so. And what's going to happen, according to them, all these aliens are going to come from outer space and they're all going to land on the earth. Now, now, I know this is kind of laughable to you, but this is what they preach and teach. This is what they believe. This is what they're waiting on. Because these aliens are more than just, you know, they're not bad. They're good. They're benevolent. Well, the devil's always sold himself as a benevolent being that he's, you know, really and truly wants to do mankind a favor. And so they're going to come back and they're going to establish themselves as our new helpers. Well, all of this, if it has any validity and, and something's going on, I mean, with all the crop circles and all that, I don't know what's going on. But it's all demonic. It's all demonic power setting up the Antichrist, setting up, I, I mean, suddenly if one day we don't believe in them, let's, say, let's just say, for instance, that I'm a non-believer. I don't believe in nothing but my Coors beer and my favorite football team. 
in my four-wheel drive. And that's my world. And suddenly, there are these demons that are passing themselves off as whatever, whether it's aliens or whatever. And they have all these new answers to life's problems. Now, here I am. I'm someone who's never believed in anything. I've never been able to believe anything that I couldn't feel, taste, touch. I'm a non-believer. That's where most of them are at. They have no faith in anything they can't see. But now suddenly I can see it. Hey, I can put my faith in that. I can trust that. And that's the type of catalyst that's going to be used by the Antichrist. And what's going to happen is what you're going to have is you're going to have demonic power. The children are already being set up for it. Some of the youth have been, most of the youth have been set up for it. A lot of adults have already been set up for it. And I read you a quote from the New Agers who, for, since December 21st of last year, have been praying. Con- what they're doing is conjuring up demons. And they're going to do that for one solid year. We fasted for seven days, thought we was doing something. They're going to do it for a year. And all these people who are susceptible to this, if you don't have Christ there, there's a void there. There's a void in you. Are you saying I'll be demon-possessed? I'm not saying that. I'm saying you're more susceptible to it. And the only way to be safe from it is to be saved. I don't know what all they're capable of doing in that. But I know the setup is there. And the world's primed for it. The world doesn't believe in anything anymore. I mean, here, here you got the Antichrist, who's all of a sudden, overnight, going to become the leader of the free world. We live in a world of doubt. We live in a world of skepticism. I mean, you know, some of you right now are going, boy, I can't believe he's going here. That's, that's the world we live in. We don't, you know, outside of us believers, if it ain't God, we don't see it. We don't believe in it. And we don't need to believe in the things of the devil, but we do need to understand that they're real. I'm not telling you to put your faith in anything other than Christ and Him crucified. You know me better than that. But you have to know that there's a plan. They're not just going to arbitrarily go, well, I hope all this works. They have got to fine-tune to a plan. And when the church is gone... When the rapture takes place, and this is one other, one more reason why the rapture has to take place first. There will be a spiritual vacuum like this world has never seen. Yes, sir. Right. Think about it. Yes. Somebody said there's two billion Christians. I hope there's that many. Yes. For the sake of illustration, we'll go with two billion. If there's two billion, let's just cut it in half. You say there's a billion. Suddenly, one out of seven people who are believers in Jesus Christ and Him crucified, and they're suddenly gone. There's not one person on the face of the earth that has a relationship with Jesus Christ, at least for a a moment of time anyway. What greater time for demonic power to begin to accomplish their setup of their plan What a better time for the Antichrist to step forward. And we know the Bible tells us that the Antichrist won't be revealed. And when he's talking about the Antichrist, he's not by himself. He's got a third of the angels with him, the ones that aren't already locked up. You think they're just going to sit around and go, well, I hope, hope something good happens for us. No, this is their window. This is their opportunity. As far as they're concerned, this is their only chance to overthrow God. And so all demonic power is going to cut loose on this earth. That's why it'll be the greatest tribulation period since the beginning of time. Not only will all the things that God allows to come, just the demonic power itself and all that that involves. It's going to be chaos, folks. I mean, it's going to be absolute chaos. And there are people out there who just... ah, I have a, a relative whose spouse was an obvious non-believer. Didn't believe in God. Mother law told him, I can't believe you don't believe in God. And I told her, I said, I'm going to tell you something. I said, I, if I was a gambling man, I'd be willing to put a lot of money on the fact within a year or two, he won't be an atheist anymore. 
he'll either believe in God or he'll believe in a false guy, one of the two. There won't be any atheists left on the face of the earth. They'll believe either in the true God or they're going to believe in a lie. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm telling you, it's coming. When the transgression is full, if my musicians will come, please. When the transgression comes to the full, when it is finished, we will have the awesome privilege to come back with Christ for him to once and for all put this revolt down. The only thing that will take place after that is after a thousand years, and I don't want to get into the millennium right now, but in a thousand years he'll loose the devil for a short period of time. And even after a thousand years of Christ's reign and living in a world where the lamb lies with the lion, you'll still have people who will be transgressors. You'll still have people who will be looking for the things of the enemy. Transgression will come to a full. Whatever plan the devil has, whatever scheme, and I, and, and I may not have it exactly right. I don't, I don't have a blueprint of their plan. I just know that there's great deception involved in it, and I can, you know, I can see the signs of the times. I can see what's going on in our world. I can see the lies that are being told. I mean, that, that's awesome. These, you know, I haven't been to the movie in 20-something years, but all I see being shown in the movies is, is either outer space, Dracula's, werewolves, what's a new one, Walking Dead, all these things. Sound like a bunch of rock groups, don't it? Yes. Being set up. Yes. Our children are being set up. Yes. There's going to be a lot of innocence that I'm going to be caught up in this. I still believe, I, I, I'm of the belief that, that God's going to save the children. Amen. I just believe he's a merciful God. Yes. But there's, a, there's an age limit there. Yes, there is. What's the age of accountability? Don't have a clue. I would say it depended on the child. Yes. And we have parents who won't even take their kids to church. We won't even give them the opportunity to make the decision. And transgressions come to full. And it comes to full. Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning.